Welcome to Quadratic Iterations Part 2. Wow, what is this? I think you can see we mentioned it at the beginning of the last presentation there. Have a look up here. Looks like alien creatures or something. What do you reckon that little dude in there looks like? Hey, self-similar. I think we mentioned that. Oh, these, these are examples of fractals and down the bottom here, this row with different magnifications. Okay, giving self-similar images. So uh, we're going to have a look at where that name came from and the uh, mathematician Mandelbro who actually discovered this stuff. Okay, and up here we're just reminding ourselves that we are plotting on the Argand diagram these uh, points, these iterations of Z going to Z squared plus C or stuff like that. And we're going to be talking about uh, a particular set now that's been identified by uh, a mathematician called Gaston Julia. Okay, let's go down and see how we can develop these patterns. It's really interesting stuff. The first one we're going to look at is exactly that, the Julia sets. And uh, here we've got a comment. Just to start this, I want you to check that you've discovered this already. The unit circle is a boundary between two conflicting regions. Inside it, points are pulled towards zero under the iteration. Okay, so they converge. And outside it, points are pulled to infinity. You might look at the importance of the modulus here, the size of the complex number. When you square it, of course, if it's bigger than 1, then it's going to diverge and go to infinite values. If it's less than 1, it's going to converge. If it equals 1, it's going to be right on that boundary, that unit circle. So just remember that. Well, Dumois theorem, z to the n equals r to the n cis n theta. Don't forget that one. And this is going to drive it. The argument is going to take it around and around, but the size of the complex number, r, is going to determine things like is it going to stay on the unit circle, is it going to converge, diverge. So think about that now. You're supposed to know that already. Okay, let's go on now and have a look at the Julia sets here. So uh, here it's a set of points on the boundary of the particular iterative procedure or the, the uh, orbit diagram you get when you plot the complex numbers. Okay, so here we're going to look at just the simplest quadratic iteration, z going to z squared. And of course, the Julia set would be, if it's on the boundary, it'll be the unit circle, z going to z squared. Okay, so it's going to be the set of all points on the boundary of the iteration. So for z going to z squared, we know that's going to be the circumference of that unit circle. Okay, let's go down and let's develop it a bit now. Here, what we're going to do is to say, well, is there such thing as a filled-in Julia set? So what about all the points that uh, don't diverge outside the unit circle? Well, let's look at the points that all converge, and they all lie in here in the filled-in Julia set, if you like. The ones that uh, converge, the modulus, is of, of, modulus of z is less than 1, and all those points are going to be drawn inwards there. That's called the filled-in Julia set. So just a few interesting little ways of discussing what we are finding here. So I've got uh, screen clippings here from Hayes and Harris Publications. They've got some good software on board here. Okay, and I want you to try and use that rather than try and do anything on your calculator. So we're now going to look at the Julia set where we are iterating z squared plus c again. Remember... This uh, iter iterative procedure depends on a starting value of z and the complex number that we add. Mandelbro did it slightly differently. We're going to have a look at that in a minute. And, uh, but we're going to have a fixed number c and varying z this time. So c is fixed. Okay, so uh, I want you to actually start these with the um, uh, software. First of all, we've just done C is naught, haven't we? Z going to Z squared, and we've said that's the picture we get. But what happens if you have Z squared take a half, and we go through and do um, various Z values? Okay, now that's what you can use, do using this software. So I want you to quickly do that, and then do various Cs here. So we're looking at the set now. Just get this clear. We're looking at the set where... We have a fixed C, and we're looking at various Z's there. That's the Julia set. 
fixed complex number C and varying Z. And we're going to com contrast that with Mandelbrot sets later on. Okay, draw their orbit plots. Now, I've been asked by a few students, does the orbit plot, let's look at it now, and I think um, I could have explained this better in the first um, presentation. Does the orbit plot mean you're adding complex numbers? No, it does not. You might start with a half I, and then it might go to um, something like uh, a 2 uh, plus I. So then you, that is the plot of 2 plus I. Now the iteration has moved out there, but you don't actually add 2 plus I to a half I as such. Okay, you plot 2 plus I. Okay, so this is not a vector uh, 2, 1. Okay, this is a point plotted from uh, 2, 1 down there. Okay, so you got that idea. The orbit plot, although we do sometimes use arrows to indicate where the iteration is leading us, the orbit plot is the plot of the actual new iterative uh, value there. Okay, just check that as you go. All right, have a go there, and I'm going to ask you whether you got this result about z squared take a half. Come down here, and did you get that? You should have discovered that the filled in Julia set for z going to z squared take a half, that is keep this fixed and have a lot of different z's. You get this filled in set where the points inside are being are converging and uh, we've got that boundary there. Nice fancy shape. And uh, can you see the self similar nature of that? The iterative procedure is reiterating similar patterns. Okay, interesting stuff, isn't it? It's a very interesting area of mathematics. Okay, let's keep going now. Now, let's have a look at uh, having C fixed and maybe a real number there like a half and say, well, if we do that, does it have invariant points and cycles? Do, when we're doing this iterative procedure, do we get to a Z from which we go then z squared take a half and then we would go z squared take a half squared remember take a half now can that have cycles that is do you get to a point where you get a particular complex number z that after that it's equal to that so you're only going to bounce between these two okay that every the third one there once you hit this particular z uh, is going to go back and equal the original one, only giving two unique values. Uh, I should have circled the whole of that there. Hang on, just get rid of this. I should have circled all of that, shouldn't I? Okay, bouncing between Z and Z squared take a half the first two, because when you do another iteration, it is equal to the original complex number. So that would be a two cycle. Let's see if we can identify that like we were looking at before um, in the introductory presentation. All right, come down and we've got the uh, solution here. So here we are, z squared take a half. We're keeping c constant neg a half and trying different z's. So there's our first iteration. And uh, if it's going to be invariant, then we can, we can say that once we do that iteration, it still equals the original. It does not vary. Okay, so they've left that out, and then if you rearrange that, oh no, sorry, uh, they have put it there. That's all right. So Z equals the first iteration, then putting all terms on the left, uh, solving the uh, quadratic, uh, neg B plus or minus uh, square root discriminant over 2A, doing that, remember that stuff, then you've got this uh, pair of solutions. So if you have a z equal to either of those, it doesn't go anywhere. When you iterate it, z squared take a half equals the original value. Okay, what about a two cycle? I think this is what I was talking about before. Z goes to z squared take a half, then that goes to z squared take a half, all squared take a half. Okay, which is if you uh, write it out, it's that thing there. So if it's going to be a two cycle, that's going to have to equal 
the starting value, it's going to have to equal that. So that the only two values are the original and z squared a take a half. After you do another iteration, it goes back to z. Do you get it? So multiplying through by 4, you've got that. And uh, we're not going to show you the factorization of that. Uh, but you could you could factorise that. We haven't done a lot of polynomial work at this stage, so that's a bit hard. But you could come up with these solutions, because um, up here, z squared take z take a half is also solutions of that. So you could play around and try to use the uh, um, undetermined coefficients method of factorising that um, quartic down there. And if you do, you get these two values, which means these are invariant points, which are sort of the trivial solution to um, uh, cycling, isn't it? Uh, obviously, uh, z equals z equals z, z equals z squared take a half, etc. for those points, and therefore they also qualify as cyclic points. Only the two, po two values is, are not um, distinct. So an invariant point does have this property of that equals that, but they also equal each other. So it's sort of a, a, a trivial solution of uh, cycling. Okay, but these two do get out to this value, which then equals this one back again. So you do have two distinct values in the case of nega half plus or minus a half i. Do you get it? Um, not a great explanation there, if you ask me, uh, but the idea is that the invariant points satisfy the uh, condition of cycling, but you don't get distinct values, so keep them invariant. These are two cycles, so here you'd have a value here, then a value here, and then this value would equal the original z. All right, let's uh, see if you can do some like that. Here we are. Um, Z going to z squared plus c, so this is going to be a Julius set. We're going to fix uh, c with a value of neg 1 or neg 2 thirds. Okay, so the two problems here I want you to do uh, one, part 1 and 2 for this value of c and varying z's and see if you can hit a z after which it will just cycle. Uh, well, it, first of all, hit a z after which it's invariant. Hit a Z, which after that it will just two cycle. Okay, same sort of thing. Let's have a look at the solution. And we here we have it. Z going to Z squared take one. Okay, so the invariant points is when Z squared take one just gives you the original back again. It doesn't move anywhere. So that's a quadratic. You can solve it using the formula for the roots of a quadratic. So when you hit one of these values, a half plus root 5 on 2, or a half take root 5 on 2, it will stay there. It's a magic number, if you like, under this iterative procedure. It won't change. OK, what about a two cycle? We're going here, here, and then that's the next one. Um, take one. And so what's that got to be? This actually, this last expression comes to that. And you want that to be equal to the original z, so you're only going to produce a two cycle bouncing between those two. Okay, so if it equals the original, getting the quartic, you could uh, factorise out the z, and then you could use technology here, or you could say, well, you can see that z uh, equals neg 1 as a solution to that, and then do this by um, the FOIL type thing in reverse or undetermined coefficients. You're generating that quadratic in there. And then you could uh, actually, well, you could use the whole technology for the thing, but then you've got these values, and you know these two are invariant. Okay, so um, z squared take z take 1. Well, there, there's a little note. You could uh, note this using a part 1. If they're invariant points, they've got to come up as solutions to that, don't they? Because invariant points are the trivial um, example of cycles, because it just keeps going of, of its own accord it, the same value over and over so it obviously is a default cycle if you like okay so uh, naught and neg 1 is the 2 cycle going between uh, naught and neg 1 there okay so you could uh, have a look at that 
All right, so uh, did you get that one? Um, what about part B? Neg two thirds, same thing. Z squared two thirds has to equal the original for invariant points. All terms on the left, multiply through by three, and then solve the quadratic. So there, here now, if in this iterative procedure you um, use a Z of either of those two, it won't move. You'll get the same value after that iteration. Here again, uh, first iteration, and then another one, and this then, um, when you simplify it, has to equal the original. So you only end up with two distinct values. Okay, so multiplying through by 9, and then uh, we know that the invariant points here will be uh, sort of de facto or pseudo cycling points. Okay, so we can put that as a factor and then work the other factor out by undetermined coefficients or by simply working out what we need in that second factor to generate the terms in the original polynomial. All right, so that then uh, gives us the two cycle here and uh, looking at, again, the quadratic formula, we can say these are our uh, real imaginary parts for that two cycle behavior. Okay, so those two are the numbers which will cycle. Okay, um, how's it going there? Getting the idea? Uh, this is quite popular asking students to find two cycle behavior. Well, here we have it, what you've been waiting for. The Mandelbrot sets the ultimate um, iterative procedure to give fractals. Okay, and so we're looking at the same thing again, only uh, this time we're varying the C values and only starting with a Z equal to naught. We'll have a look at that in a minute, but here is the sort of definition of a fractal. Natural phenomenon or a mathematical set that exhibits a repeating pattern that displays itself at every scale. So if you look inward to these pieces here, you get a rep repetition or a self-similar pattern uh, for all of them. You can see this here, to any scale here, in this one, to any scale, uh, it's producing the same self-similar pattern. Okay, so the guy whose response for this was Mandelbro, Bernie O. Mandelbro, a, a, po a Polish mathematician. Okay, no longer alive, but he lived from 1924 to 2010. Um, and uh, he uh, gave us uh, probably the most recognized quadratic iteration of all and producing the Mandelbro set. We're going to study that now and see what you think. And he came, he's the one who came up with the word fractal from Latin fractus broken or uh, split into pieces and uh, to describe the fancy patterns created by complex quadratic iterative procedures. Like we started to see with that Z squared take a half in the Julia set, some uh, interesting shapes there, uh, reflecting the idea of um, iterative procedures, the same thing over and over, creating a pattern over and over, but broken up into pieces if you like, fractals. All right, come down and let's have a look at some properties. Now, at this stage, I think you'll need to start taking some notes because this is fairly complicated and the properties of the Mandelbro set should be known off. How do you create the set? What are its properties and so on? Okay, so here's how you create the set. And this is a typical uh, picture of the uh, or um, plot of the iterations here. And it's an interesting uh, pattern, isn't it? Okay, so here's the first point. Consider a very large number of points in the argand plane and use them as values for C. Okay, so this time we're changing C. Then for each point, we iterate this, starting with naught for Z. Okay, so we always start with Z naught equals naught. Remember, way back in the first presentation, I said there were a couple of characteristics of the iterations we've been looking at, and that was the starting value, the Z value, what we're going to do with that, and also the C value. So with Mandelbro, what we're going to do is always start with Z naught being naught and keep going um, using uh, different Cs. Now, we're going to do a lot of iterations, so this is some number of iterations called N. If the modulus of Z becomes less than 2, then 
or is less than 2, then it lies in the Mandelbrot If it is greater than 2, then the point is discarded because the size of Z rapidly blows up in a few more iterations. Oh, this is interesting. Are you asking what I'm asking? Why is the size of Z now less than 2 instead of less than 1? I wonder why that is. You might like to think about that. We'll come back to that. OK, the complete Max Mandelbrot set here, if N is infinite, if you keep going, 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 you get a more and more defined pattern or fractal. OK, so as long as the size of Z is less than 2, you cut out the noise from points that are not going to form that pattern. You've got to keep it less than 2. So once that uh, size of the iteration goes greater than 2, you discard it and you don't keep that in the set. OK, and it, it, no matter how many iterations are performed, the, the member of the set, the C value to be a member of the Mandelbrot set, has to maintain a size less than 2. OK, so do you get it? And I guess you're still thinking, why 2? Anyway, let's go on and we'll come to that later on now. OK, so here we are. Here's a, a small definition, and I would suggest you rewind the presentation and write these down as notes, each of these sections. The Mandelbrot set is a set of all complex points such that the size of Z is less than 2, always, and it stays that way, under infinitely many transformations, starting with Z equals naught. So you're playing with different C values, and you're creating Zs, that lie in the Mandelbrot set, as long as when you keep going, the size of that complex number is less than 2. OK. Do you get it? That's our definition. All right. Let's go down now. I want you to use that magic software again. Uh, very good from Hayes and Harris Publications. And uh, you'll have to click on that using your uh, electronic copy, your uh, disk. OK. Show the Mandelbrot set with the number of iterations equal to that. Uh, and that is the end value, if you like. Set the number of iterations to a thousand and show the set highlighting points that converge. Okay, show the set highlighting two cycle, three cycle, and then the set that are chaotic. Okay, and if you keep going to four thousand, you'll find that the pattern, I can't show that here with this uh, sort of presentation, but the uh, pattern gets more defined, I think. Have a look at it. More defined, the larger the number of iterations. And remember, the idea with Mandelbrot, the Mandelbrot set, is it um, has an inf possible of a, possibility of an infinite number of iterations, and uh, that it uh, does not uh, then, uh, or consists of those uh, numbers, Z, whose modulus are less than 2, no matter how many iterations you do. All right, have a play with that. And I'm going to summarise it down here now. OK, again you need to write these down. The greater the number of iterations, the more definition of the Mandelbrot set. All the points in the main body converge to a unique point. That's like the Julia set we mentioned before, filled in. All the points in each lobe of the set, did you see this? The lobes give rise to cycles. And the number of the cycle is dependent on the lobe. OK, so all the points in a lobe will give a certain cycle, two cycle, three cycle, etc. OK, then points which exhibit chaotic behaviour lie on the outer extremities of the set. And you can sort of see that from the pictures we've seen already, I think. Here we are, this is important now. In a lobe, the further you are from the centre, the greater the number of iterations before a cyclic pattern is reached. I wonder if you've got that concept. Um, and the idea is that if you are at the centre of the lobe, that is the, let's say, centre of the lobe, it gives a two cycle. What that means is you're at the Z such that after that one iteration there, you have a two cycle. Oops, I've got to put that too soon. You have a two cycle. It goes here, and get rid of this, goes here, and this one immediately comes back to that. You don't have a number of Zs before you get to a pattern of two cycling. 
Okay, that's the difference. So this could occur further away from the centre. It takes more iterations before you re reach the um, value, the Z value, which is then going to two cycle. Okay, if you're at the centre, you're you're going to have immediate immediate two cycling. Okay, so if you do what we did up before, you're talking about getting the centres of the lobe where you have a two cycle. Okay, so you better note that down and see if you can understand it. Talk it with your class, talk talk about it with your classmates and your teacher and so on, and try to get a grip on what's going on here. Okay, let's go down and have a look now. A bit more of a summary here of the Mandelbro set. Okay, um, here we've got what I've just said. I think we're just go, we're reiterating this. Oh, how appropriate that is. Having observed the behaviour in the various lobes, we know that cyclic patterns exist throughout the set. However, since C varies everywhere, the points which are in each cycle are never the same. Okay, because they're all different Cs. Do you get that one? What's interesting is the points are at the very centre of each lobe. We observed in the previous uh, investigation, the closer we are, the faster cyclic behaviour occurs. And if we're in the exact centre, that's what I was just talking about a minute ago, cycling is immediate. You don't have to do several iterations before you get that cyclic pattern. Okay, so the trivial case of this, of course, is where C equals naught, and uh, is the one cycle, of course, which uh, if C equals naught, uh, is going to just re re remain at uh, Z squared, Z and uh, it's not going to uh, uh, actually uh, change at all. Okay, so that's all, sort of the trivial case where uh, C equals naught. You might try doing that algebraically. Oh, I think that's coming up in a minute in uh, the exercises. All right, so come down and let's have a look at some exercises. Okay, we'll just come down here a bit more. Okay, using this, so this is generating the Mandelbro set starting with zero and for different C's, find a C for three cyclic behaviour. So you want to start an iterative procedure here which gives three cycle behaviour. So you've got naught and then uh, it's, uh, Z1 would be naught squared plus C or just plus C. Z2 would be this one squared plus C and uh, Z3, we want three cycles, so we want three these three distinct values. And then the fourth one, which is this one squared, got it, plus C, that has to equal the original. So it's got to equal naught for a three cycle, making the first three there the only distinct ones, and then they repeat. Okay, so getting that out as a quartic expanding at all, we've got this fact rising out the C, so C is naught, um, and that of course is the invariant point there, okay, so remember the invariant points always come up as cycling points because they, they don't vary, so you've got it, and then you've got another one, another one, and they're all the same, so it's a one cycle, which is invariant, it's a two cycle because that'll equal that, it's a three cycle. The trouble is the cycle is a bit false, it's a bit trivial because it's the same point, so it's really invariant points. But they do satisfy, invariant points do satisfy the condition of cycling. Okay, so what do you got? This is invariant point. These are the solutions to um, the uh, values of C in here. These are the solutions. So I've got one real solution and then plus or minus i here. Complex solutions, complex conjugate pair. Why do you expect a complex conjugate pair? Aha, because this is a real polynomial in C, and therefore uh, any uh, complex roots must occur as a conjugate pair, so the sum and product are real, and that's how they hide in there, don't they? By creating a real quadratic from this, um, which multiplied by the uh, linear real factor uh, generating that one, which would be what C plus 1.754 double eight, will give a real cubic. 
Just remember that from our complex number stuff. Okay, so these three solutions, okay, that one and plus and minus 0.744862i are the um, three values for three cycle behavior. So, what is it? If you were plotting an orbit diagram, you plot something on the real axis, and then this one, and this is I, so that's imaginary, the imaginary part, and that is the real part, and this is the imaginary part. So should we try to plot them, and these are the desired values. So here we, we know these are the centers of the three cycle lobes. Remember, when it does it in the first iteration, when you come to any of these complex numbers, then straight away it goes into a three cycle. Okay, so it's immediate. Other points in that lobe would take more iterations to get to a three cycle. Okay, let's have a look at plotting these now. Let's just draw this, we'll just make sure we're on the same page here. So the first one is um, neg 1.75488. So here, let's call this neg 1, neg 2. So it's somewhere here, okay, uh, and if you hit that, you get a cyclic behavior. Then uh, the next one is neg 0.122, somewhere in here, and 0 0.748862. So that's one, it's somewhere there, up there. And then the last one is neg this and neg that, so neg one. So they are our three um, centers of the three cycle lobes. Okay, so we could plot them if we had a Mandelbrot set. We could have we could plot those in the set to uh, have a look. So you might uh, have a look at uh, plotting those and see what you think. In fact, you could actually go back up page and have a look at the lobes of which these points are the centres. Try and plot them. Uh, I've got a little mounted bro set uh, up at the beginning of this little section. See if you can plot it within the lobe and just make sure. Okay, let's have a look now at uh, another little var variation. Perform the first few iterations and de determine whether these values of C in Z squared plus C are members of the mounted bro set. If so, predict their behavior. So we've got a complex one here and a negative real number here. So what do we do with Mandelbrot? We fix, well, we fix a starting point at zero. So we've got to square that and add the complex number. And then we're going to square that complex number uh, and add a half plus half i. So here it is. This one squared plus half plus a half i. And you're doing this on the calculator, of course, here. So you take that one and square it and uh, add a half plus half i and go down. And you can do the absolute values here as you go. And you can see uh, very shortly at the said fifth one, the size has gone bigger than two. So this initial C value used in the iterative procedure is not in the Mandelbrot set. Okay, so that one's ex exploded, if you like, and will be outside the boundaries of the Mandelbrot set. Let's look at it. the other one, naught. So we'll want to square it and take that, which is just that. Then we're going to take this, square it, and take that value, and keep going. Okay, and take that value. So in the end, you're getting a very, very small value. So the size of Z is approximately, these are all approximately, of course, rounded off. It's approximately zero. And so it is a member of the Mandelbrot and four cycles. Can you see that? You've got naught, which is back up there. So how many distinct values? You've got the first one, second, third, and fourth. Okay, so that's a four cycle. So that should be what? Should be in the center of a lobe, shouldn't it? Okay, just check that. All right, let's have a look at doing some for yourself. Find the center of the lobe of the Mandelbrot set in which all took points two cycle. So have a look at that one 
and uh, go and do uh, again uh, what we've just done there in question two. And uh, then I want you to think about, and it's still there, isn't it? What is so special about the size of Z being two? Uh, could you actually prove that the process must diverge independent of the value of C um, as long as the uh, size of Z, uh, well, if it's greater than two, that it diverges. So if it's less than two, it will not. It will stay within the set. Otherwise, it explodes, if you like. Why is it two? So you might think about that. Uh, I'm going to show you the solutions in a minute to all this and give you a little proof for that one. Okay, come down now and have a look at the solutions. Question one and question two. Okay. All right, how did you go? What should we do now? Well, I think what we might try to do is to do a little proof of uh, this um, uh, size of Z being greater than two is gonna give divergence. Let's see if we can do that now. Okay, so what we're going to try and do is put down a little proof about this importance of the size of Z being two. All right, so here we go. What's our problem? Uh, what we've got to do is to say, if uh, the modulus of z to a particular number z is greater than 2, then the um, iterations diverge. So that is, the size of z will become infinite, if you like, as we take more iterations. That's what we've got to prove, that it somehow is, the, rotate, is revolving around 2, um, and therefore... The interesting point of this, isn't it? This implies uh, that the entire set, Mandelbrot set, uh, I'll call it M set, it's hard to write on the screen, um, lies within not a radius one circle, but within an R equals two circle. That would be a geometric implication of that, wouldn't it? Okay. Now, I'm going to show you a proof where we need the, um, what, triangle inequality. Now, you might have seen this before. Um, well, I hope you have. Um, but usually it's something like the sum of two sides of a triangle greater than or equal to the, the length of the third one. Um, the sum of the two lengths greater than or equal to the third. But what we're going to do here is... Um, use it differently, or we could say the length of x plus y, that side, um, plus the length of y is greater or equal to the length of x. We can choose any two sides, can't we? If we've got x and y, well, let's do it differently so it makes it a little bit easier. If we go x and y, then this is x plus y, if you like, thinking about vectors. So we could say the sum of this one and this one is greater than the third. And that gives rise to a slightly different um, inequality. It's greater than or equal to mod x take mod y. But it's still true by the triangle inequality. Well, let's have a look now at the two cases. Let's take case where... Um, what would you say? Um, um, size of C uh, less than or equal to 2, maybe. Okay, let's take the case where it is small enough to be a member of the set. Okay, so uh, if, we, if we now do what? We can say, uh, uh, let's take a complex number which has a size greater than 2. Okay, so in other words, the size of this complex number is 2 plus, let's say, epsilon, just a small value, where this epsilon is greater than 0. 
So we're starting off with a C value less than 2, and the size of Z there is going to be um, greater than 2, and let's have a look there. Okay, so first of all, let's do an iteration on it. So we get to this point, so it's ZK squared plus C. That's our first iteration. Um, has to greater than or equal to, using the triangle inequality I just put up there a minute ago, that take C by a triangle inequality. Okay, let's come down page a little bit. Okay, so it must be therefore absolutely greater than ZK squared take ZK because the size of ZK is greater than 2, which would be greater than or equal to the size of C from what we said before. All right, so what's this equal? This is equal to uh, size of ZK squared. Okay, properties of modulus, therefore. Um, take, um, we could put, take one, factorize it, that we could factorize it like that. Okay, which is the size of ZK. Now, the size, size of ZK take one. How can we get to that? And we've say, said the size of ZK is greater than is equal to up here, 2 plus epsilon. So this is 1 plus epsilon here. Okay, do you get that line there? Size of, Z of the, uh, ZK, we've said, is 2 plus um, epsilon. It's a little bit bigger than 2, okay, because that's what we're considering here. Okay, all right. Now, what about uh, what we can do with this then, what are we saying here? Uh, well, what we're saying is really that as you go on, the size of the next iteration is greater than the size of the previous one plus one plus, or times one plus epsilon. That's what we've got. So, in other words, this Z, the next iteration is going to be further from the origin than um, than the the original previous or the previous value of the complex number. Okay, we're getting anywhere? Do you think? Um, we've we're saying well also the size of Z k plus one is uh, greater than two. We've said that. Um, okay, so what could you say? The next one, um, the next iteration will be greater than the previous one times uh, 1 plus epsilon. Each time you do it, you've got that little bit more, if you like. So what, what are we seeing here? Uh, every iteration, you're multiplying by 1 plus epsilon. Now, I'm not going to do the full inductive proof here, but if you use that... Um, mathematical induction idea here, you can see that if you went on, you would have this bigger than z to the k, 1 plus epsilon to the n. Every time you do an iteration, it's going to have that factor 1 plus epsilon bigger. Okay, and what's going to happen to that? Well, this uh, here, what did we say? We said that was the size of that was 2, 1 plus epsilon to the n. So this, the size of the complex number is bigger than 2, and that's going to, what, what's it going to do if this is a positive epsilon? This is a number bigger than 1, so this is going to tend to infinity as um, the number of iterations becomes infinite. Okay, because this n, well, this n is actually going to be the number of iterations as well, so I should really put this as n here. Um, but we're using big N earlier. Okay, can you see how it's growing uh, if you have that first condition? Now, what about the other condition? Let's say the, uh, the size of the C value 
is starts off at bigger than two. Can we have a look at that scenario now and see what happens there? So let's look case um, the size of C is greater than two. So you can, you're starting to see why the two comes in now. Okay, now let's have a look. Um, we're going to have a look at any time when the size of the iteration is greater than or equal to um, size of C, because that's the two value. Let's see if we can prove divergence. We've, we've proved divergence there, um, and let's have a look at this situation, uh, the different value of C. Okay, um, let's write, therefore, the size of C as equal to 2 plus epsilon, and epsilon is going to be greater than all again. Okay. So what do we got? The triangle inequality again. Let's have a look at the next iteration. So here it's going to be greater than ZK squared. Size that. Take the size of C, and that's by the triangle inequality again, using that form of it. So it's greater than or equal to the size of this. Take the size of K. Okay, the original one. Therefore, factorising it again, um, putting this in this form. Oh, no, hang on. Just factorising that. Take one, as we did before. And therefore, this is greater than or equal to size of ZK by one plus epsilon. Same idea. Okay. So, if this is bigger than uh, C now, what's going to happen here? We're going to have the same thing. Um, this one, here, K plus 1, is going to be greater than or equal to size of K when, whenever the size of that is greater than or equal to the size of C. Now, so what this is saying is as soon as ZK uh, lies on or outside the circle of radius 2, on or outside, hang on, on or outside, what can we say? Um, a circle of size C, where it's greater than 2 for the radius, okay. Um, the next one lies even further. Okay, so let's put that down. Um, ZK plus 1 lies further. Okay, so what, what we can say, therefore, is uh, this as before. Uh, K plus N is greater than or equal to the size of ZK. 1 plus epsilon to the N. And as before... So the size of the complex number is going to be infinite as n tends to infinity. And that, that's, well, we should really put both at the end of this, so this is as required. So we've looked at the sort of thing driving the Mandelbrot set. Yeah, are the two cases, aren't there, um, where the complex number that we start with is z equals naught, but we have a, a c value either bigger than 2 or less than 2. So in either case, we've got the similar sort of discussion here that the size of the next iteration is going to be larger, okay, whether, uh, uh, whether or no there, so uh, for that C value, okay, so if the size of the complex number um, gets bigger than 2, and even if we start with a C of less than 2, Okay, we've just said if the C is less than 2 up above, then um, it's still going to uh, get larger um, once you uh, get a value bigger than 2 for the size of the complex number. Okay, do you get it? We, we had to look at two situations where the size of the C value was greater than 2 and less than 2 and examine what happens as the iteration proceeds and what is the importance of the um, value 2. So what that says is the Mandelbrot set won't uh, uh, plot outside 
of uh, the circle radius 2 on the Argan diagram. Do you get that idea? That's why it's always inside there. All right, see if you can understand that proof. Uh, fairly long, try to do it nice and slowly. Um, sorry about the glitch on the screen there, flicking on and off, uh, but see what you make of it. All right, I hope to catch you in uh, another presentation. Cheers for now.